Hi everyone, thank you for joining our webinar on the fundamentals of retail pricing. I'm Sarah Stockton, Director of Marketing at Clear Demand. The intent of the, intent of the webinar today is purely educational. Uh, this is not a sales pitch, however, we will provide contact information at the end of the presentation if you have any sales related questions. For the duration of the webinar, all of your microphones will be muted, so don't worry about muting on your side. If you do have a question, we, we welcome those throughout the webinar and you can submit those through the question button on the top right hand side of your screen. And also those questions will remain anonymous. We'll, we'll pause during the, web, the webinar to answer those and we'll also allow some time towards the end of the presentation for any additional questions we haven't gotten to. Presenting today is Dr. Jim Sills, President and CEO of Clear Demand. Jim co-founded Clear Demand 10 years ago with the mission to build pricing solutions that deliver more value faster through more accurate forecasts and easier adoption. Prior to starting Clear Demand, Dr. Sills pioneered the first price optimization solution for retail at Chymetrics and was the CEO of Re CTO of Revionics. He worked in signal intelligence for a number of years at Southwest Research Institute and taught at the University of Texas. He did his PhD in electrical engineering at Georgia Tech. Dr. Sills has published over 20 papers and has nearly 20 patents. Today, Dr. Sills is presenting the fundamental concepts for retail pricing that are essential for pricing practitioners. Attendees will learn how price can be used as a powerful lever to drive profit and revenue. He will present price elasticity and the sweet spot for efficient retail pricing which is fundamental to managing category level price strategy. He will demystify pricing by walking through an example of how to use historical sales, price and cost to calculate price elasticity and optimal price in Excel. He will briefly discuss how business rules play a role in pricing and provide some insights into promotional pricing. So with no further ado, here is Dr. Sills. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, Hello everyone, I feel honored to be addressing you today. Um, gathered on this call are VPs of pricing and, and directors of pricing, managers, analysts from retailers that manage over $500 billion in transactions annually. In a free market economy, we believe that every transaction benefits the buyer and the seller, otherwise why would they participate? Getting the price right is really about balancing the mutual benefits of these transactions. Um, today, I'm joined by Joe McCorkle, who ran pricing at HEB for a number of years and has worked with retailers around the globe putting pricing science into practice. Joe will be offering commentary today during uh, today's webinar. So let's jump in and look at what we're gonna be covering today. I What, what we're gonna learn today is when you should take a price up and when you should take a price down. Um, and what is an optimal price? Uh, and how do I optimize price in Excel? Because that's that's the tool that's most widely available to retailers. And you really can do some powerful things in Excel um, with data that really should be available to you. It's just difficult to scale that um, to, a, uh, to, a, to an enterprise. Um, but, but you can you know, truly find some value in your business just using Excel, uh, as long as you know what to do with it. And you're gonna see what, what you, you do with it today. Um, there's this concept of efficient pricing, um, and we're gonna cover that. It really applies to uh, a category or a subcategory. It's when you're pricing a group of items that efficiency really comes into play. And we're gonna, we're gonna have a little bit of entertainment today as we go through this webinar playing off of the efficient frontier and uh, the final frontier. So there's this concept of the efficient frontier, and I think you're gonna see a few Star Trek characters as we go through this. So hopefully this will be you know, kind of entertaining for you as well. Um, and then how do I price with business rules? We're gonna, we're gonna you know, learn what you should, how you should think about business rules when you're, when you're thinking about trying to optimize price. And then anybody who's been in pricing for you know any real length of time has has heard the term price elasticity, and may not really understand what it is. So we're going to describe it, um, define it, and describe how to use it and and what it really means. 
And then of course, a lot of retailers promote, and what does it mean to optimize your promotions? We're gonna cover that. So that's a lot to cover, but I think by the end, you're gonna find that we, we nailed every one of these, um, these topics. So, so really the, the theme is that retailers um, are trying to, to run their businesses as best as possible. One thing I've learned in all my years is that there's never enough money um, but there can be, you know, you can get as much money as you possibly, you know, you can get an optimal amount of profit or revenue as long as you're not stuck in inefficient pricing. So you're going to see that as we go through here. So let's start with some data. Um, this is real retail data uh, showing an item uh, that was priced at $2 for a period of time, and then the price increased to $3. So if you look here, this is when the price increased uh, to $3. And the unit sales, when it was $2, were, was averaging about 60. And then when the price raised was raised to $3, the unit sales um, averaged, let's say, about uh, 40. So that's some real data. And we're going to assume, um, although it's not really shown here, but, but let's just say the cost is a dollar. So a lot of retailers, um, follow what's called cost plus pricing. And I'm going to give you sort of a, a introduction to cost plus pricing so that we can contrast that with optimal pricing, uh, because I think it's, it's, it's instructive. Um, cost plus pricing says your price ought to be your cost plus some markup. Okay, some markup, um, which is really just cost plus some markup rate times cost or just some markup factor times cost. So in, in our example, we've got cost is $2 and price we know started out as, I'm sorry, cost was $1 and price started out as $2. So that's that turns out to be a markup of a dollar, um, a markup rate of 100% and a markup factor of two. So, but notice that it's cost plus something. And we're gonna turn the tables on this equation um, as we go through this presentation. So now returning to our data, um, where at $2 we sold 60 and at $3 we sold 40, what we really want to know is what would we sell at any price? So we're looking for uh, what is the quantity uh, as a function of price. And a very good model for this is, is expressed here by this equation. This is what we call a complex, or um, it, this is just a, an exponential, um, decaying exponential. That's a function of price, P. But there's two parameters in here. One is um, a parameter that, that tells you how sensitive the shoppers are to price. It tells you how fast units drop as you raise the price. And the other quantity is just setting a baseline. And I'm going to tell you that this, this curve fit for the, um, these two data points is defined by these two parameters and this equation. Now, I'm going to tell you how to get these parameters in a few slides. But for now, I want you to just take it on faith that these, these two parameters give you this um, relationship. So now that we have unit sales as a function of price, we can get more information that's very useful. In, in particular, revenue as a function of price. So revenue is unit sales times price. I told you we, we know unit sales as a function of price. If we know price, we've got revenue. And we can get profit because profit is unit sales times price minus cost. So the red line here uh, is showing you as a function of price, the revenue. And the blue line is showing you um, the profit. And this, this relationship where Profit and revenue rise and fall like this is true for every product that you have. It's it, it, the shape may change a little bit, but generally this concept of of a maximum uh, revenue followed by a maximum profit holds true for every product in your in your assortment unless you have a negative cost. Um, so how did let's look at this a little bit more and try to see if we believe it. Well. At zero price, you've got a very negative profit and you have zero revenue. I believe that because people are walking out the door paying nothing for it. You're losing cost on every item. 
and so um whoop are we uh are we not sharing the right screen or is it oh, okay okay whoop, whoop, whoop. oh i just did the thing i did yesterday hold on guys let's go to home sorry guys just got to jump back to here okay okay sorry we we were wondering if screens were updating uh, in a reasonable time just a second there we are okay so again we were we were looking over here at zero price selling this combination of profit and revenue and we we felt like that was justified this is an interesting data point where price equals cost that's where you have zero profit then you reach this maximum revenue and then later a maximum profit and then uh, your price rises and uh, you start selling less and less and less and, and your profit and revenue drop. So um, so if this is what it looks like for every item, what can we, you know, what, what are the insights that we can we can gain from this? Well, the first insight is that we have three regions of pricing. We have this region over here that we'll call a low price where you could raise price and make more profit and revenue. And then you have this region that we'll call a high price um, where you can lower price and make more profit and revenue. And then you have this region where you can raise or lower price and trade profit for revenue. And one would, would you know, I, I think one could argue that there's no reason to be priced in this region because why would you be when you can lower price and make more profit and revenue? And why would you be priced over here? So generally, these are areas you don't want to be priced, but there are some reasons to argue that yes, you know, you may you may want to be out here. For example, there may be some kind of a grand turbo gas grill on the floor um, that is sitting next to you know the next level down in a, maybe a good, better, best uh, structure, and you want the the grand turbo to set a reference price so that the the next level down the medium or the the good looks looks like it's a, a better deal same thing over here i've seen strawberries priced below cost many times in a promotion because um you're trying you're using it to get people in the store so there are reasons to be outside what we call the sweet spot but for most of your items this is where you want to be now when should you take price up and down so i've told you uh, you know obviously you should take price up if you're in this region down in that region but what if you're in the sweet spot is there a good reason to go up or down in that region well absolutely there is um let's suppose you're priced at maximum profit if you're at maximum profit you could lower the price give up almost no profit but make make some some measurable revenue because the slope of the revenue curve is steeper than the slope of the uh, profit curve. And similarly, if you're at maximum revenue, you could raise price, give up a, you know very little revenue and make some substantial profit. So anytime you're out here at max revenue or max profit, you're probably, um, it, there's probably a good reason to trade a little bit of profit or revenue because you're gonna, you, that trade-off is gonna be very favorable to you. So I think, now we've answered when should you take price up or down this is not optimization it's just simply you know looking at things very intuitively and and trying to understand what what you should do now now let's address what is the optimal price hey jim uh yeah. before we move on we have a couple questions on those slides um so the first question is what if i have never changed price on an item yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, if you have a new item, you maybe have never changed the price. Um, and what you need to do then is is draw on information from related items. Um, or, you know, maybe you're trying to get the elasticity of that item in one, uh, say, store or zone or state. Maybe it's had a price change in another store or zone or state. So you're going to share information across. Uh, products and stores when information is limited for a particular item in a particular store. And the sharing of that information is really 
kind of the secret sauce of some of you know of demand modeling. There's there are some well-known techniques like a Bayesian maximum likelihood estimator that will allow you to share information you know very readily. But then there's some other um, very intelligent inferencing uh, schemes that can be applied as well. And those are really beyond the, the you know the, the scope of what we're covering today. But I will say that um, those capabilities are you know should be in the you know any tools that you use um, from a from a vendor like say Clear Demand because um, you know that that's that's what you know that's how you get this kind of technology to extend to the whole enterprise. Any anything else? Yeah, uh, one more question is um, how do I account for seasonality? In pricing oh um, yeah so I haven't you know the example we're looking at is a very non seasonal kind of example and you're absolutely right um, it, it could be that um, the season ended right there when that price increased and that all of that the um, uh, drop in units was really attributed to the season ending maybe school maybe it was a school item in school you know went out of session or something now that wasn't the case here but you know you can get what's called collinearity between price changes and things like seasonal changes or weather events or other events um, promotions and so on so you have to be you've got to unravel all that collinearity and that's that's again what you know these bayesian maximum likelihood estimators do they figure all that out um and the, you know and then again some intelligent inferencing and you know generally you want to estimate the seasonality at a you know at some kind of a group level a group of products in a group of stores and then um, de-seasonalize your data before you apply the techniques i'm presenting here so um, if you're dealing with the seasonal category you should you should de-seasonalize it um, which again beyond the scope of what we're covering here today all right so let's talk about optimal price so if i look at the same data we've been you know presenting but now in a tabular form where i'm just going to you know show you price cost in units and i'm going to um you know you know uh, again i'm using the beta i'm using the queue that I'm, i've asked you to take on faith but you know with that beta in that queue and excel by plugging in you know this data into this formula um, you can get the units. So, you know, that's the formula that you would use in Excel to calculate um, the units, uh, given the beta, given the price, given the Q, and so on. Now, the question is, great, I can see my units in a tabular form, but what's optimal? Well, you know, usually people are thinking about profit and revenue in retail. And so, which of these profits and revenues would be optimal. Well, it turns out if all you care, care about is revenue, then 250 is your optimal price. If all you care about is profit, then 350 is your optimal price. But it could be that we care about profit and revenue equally, where we, you know, in this case, we're weighting those equally, blending them together, and now you're in between. You're at $3 for an optimal price. So which one of these is optimal? Well, it's really a function of your strategy what is what what are you trying to do with your with this product or this category are you trying to drive traffic into the store well then you want to be at the lower price you want to be you know be maybe at max revenue are you trying to you know reward your shareholders pay a big dividend um pay for opening some new stores maybe um then then you know profit might be your strategy or some blend so you can really be anywhere in here um the thing that you know is kind of interesting is that um, if you are, we're going to see it in a minute that if you are going for re max revenue or max profit, you can make some changes um, where you can make a very favorable trade-off in profit and revenue. We'll we'll see that in a minute. So let's return now um, and see if we can. I'm going to kind of go in that direction now. So this this again, this is this is a very valuable image to have in your in your mind as you think about pricing this revenue and profit image so we're going to work with this a little bit further now so i'm going to repeat this this is the same image we just looked at 
you're looking at uh, price uh, and dollars, and you're looking at revenue and profit, um, as shown here. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to plot the same data, but I'm going to plot it on a graph that shows revenue versus profit. So how do I do that? Well, I take my very negative profit at zero price and my zero revenue at zero price, and I plot that data point right there. Very negative profit, zero revenue. And then when I get to, you know, I keep plotting these, these combinations of, of profit and revenues until I get to this point where uh, price equals cost and, and profit is zero. That's this point right here. Um, zero uh, profit and, and a, you know, a positive revenue. All the way up until this red dot, which corresponds to this revenue and that profit, and continuing to this blue dot, which is this profit and that revenue. And then as I increase, you know, I keep going, I keep plotting all these combinations. So this, this graph is very interesting. And what I really care about is just this, this little part of it. So now I'm gonna plot just this part of it. There we are. This is, this is what we call the opportunity curve. Um, and it's the opportunity of, you know, the, the, for combinations of profit and, and revenue as a, you know, for all the various price points that you have. You could be a maximum revenue or maximum profit. And here's the thing that's interesting. If you are at maximum revenue, you could um, raise price a little bit and look what you're doing. You're making a lot of profit because you're moving up this curve fast, but how much revenue have you given up? Almost none. So, um, you know, th th there's, because of that, you know, th th there's a favorable, favorable trade-off to increase price if you're in this range and decrease price if you're in that range. So these are the kind of ranges that tend to be pretty good for, you know, for, a, you know, for pricing. Um, but, but where in that range really depends on, do I want to lean more toward profit or more toward revenue? Okay, so, um, so now we've covered what an optimal price is. So I'm going to come back now. I'm filling the screen with equations, but all I'm doing here is fulfilling my promise that I uh, said I would show you how to do this in Excel. And I'm, I told you I would, I would uh, show, you know, demystify this beta and Q. So where does beta and Q come from? Well, they come from these, this formula for beta, which is a function of the unit sales, um, you know, at the second price point of $3 and the unit sales at the first price point of $60, or, or the first price point of $2, which is 60, divided by that change in price. And that's how I got the 0.41. And plugging that in um, here, times price one and, you, and then the log of unit sales one, you, you get the 4.9. And the, so the only trick about doing this in Excel is that you got to use the right log function and it's the natural log. So if you use that log function, um, you can calculate really from just knowing two data points, you can calculate your, <clears throat> your beta, your Q, and from that you can get your profits and revenues and do all, you know, do all this, everything I've shown you today. Not, nothing is out of reach um, where you need a, a tool uh, from a vendor to start doing some, some really powerful things with your pricing. Now, we've only been looking at one product, but the reality is retailers deal with lots of products. So in order to understand how you handle, say, a whole category or subcategory, let's just start with two products. Let's just add one more product. So here I'm graphing the same data we started with, this is pro the product we've, we've been working with. It's product, I'm gonna call it product one now. Um, remember it, it sells 60 at $2 and 40 at $3. So this is, this is the first product. I've introduced a second product that's a little bit more price sensitive because it also sells 60 at $2, but when I raise the price to $3, it drops to about 37 units which is a little bit lower. So, so the units dropped further because of the, that price sensitivity. Um, and I'm just gonna tell you now that the elasticity of our first product was 0.8 and the elasticity of this new product is 1.2. It's a little more sensitive, but we're gonna, I'm gonna define and tell you what elasticity is and how to think about it in, in, a, few, you know, in a little bit. So if we take these two products 
and we plot their opportunity curve. So this is the same opportunity curve that we've been looking at all, all through this presentation. And now this is the opportunity curve for this new second product. Now, um, what I can, can show is that at $2, I was here on the opportunity curve for the first product. And at $2, I'm here. Um, I'm in the sweet spot for the opportunity curve on the second product. So this is interesting. And, I, and, I'm, and the reason it's interesting is because with the elasticity of 1.2, we're going to find, and I'll show it to you in, a, in just a bit, that when you're above one, you're always above the maximum revenue point, which would be about here. So you're above that with a elasticity of 1.2. And with the elasticity of 0.8, you're below the maximum revenue point. So elasticity alone gives you, you know, a, a real good indication of where you might be on these opportunity curves. And I've also just, you know, for your benefit, I've given you the cue and the beta for the second product. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. And this is where you should really pay attention because I'm guessing you probably have never seen this before. Um, if I plot, the profit and revenue for um, these two products in combination, the sum of them, the, the sum of the profit and revenue, when they're both priced at $2, I'm going to get um, $120 of revenue plus another $120 of revenue. That should be $240 of revenue. And I'm going to get $60 of profit plus another $60 of profit. That's $120 of profit. So if I was to say, I want to price these two items at two dollars. Um, show me where they land on a profit revenue graph. They would land right here. Okay, so that's 240 revenue, 120 profit. And I'm also showing you a whole bunch of other profit and revenues. Well, where'd those come from? Well, it's just taking this profit and revenue and maybe you know all the other different profit and revenues on this curve. And same thing, this profit and revenue and all these other profit and revenues on this, this curve. And I'm combining every combination of point on each of these curves together. And that's how I get all these different profit and revenue points. So these are all the profit and revenue um, combinations that are achievable through price changes alone. Now, what's what you want to do next is say, well, a lot of these aren't really that interesting because if I'm priced at $2, on each item, why wouldn't I rather be priced, you know, over here, whatever these prices are, because these are, I'm making more profit and more revenue if I'm priced at any of these, these points in this, this wedge, if you will. So let's delete that point. In fact, let's delete all the points where another point exists that has more profit and revenue. And guess what I get? I get the efficient frontier. So this is, you know, this is why we um, have talked about um, the final frontier, the efficient frontier. This is the reason the Star Trek uh, entertainment is in this presentation is because this is really telling you what are optimal price points for a category for two products in this example. Um, but by moving from just some you know, non-optimal combination of prices to optimal, you can pick up in this example, 160 basis points of revenue and 800 basis points of profit. That is huge. Um, so th this is what we mean by efficient pricing. It means you're picking price combinations for which there's no other price combination that will deliver more profit and revenue. Now, if you want to get into, you know, we're going to get into some some other aspects of this around um, price image and other things. Uh, well, let me say it this way. We're not going to get into other, you know, topics of price image in this presentation. But you can um, look at things like a constrained optimization where I want to maximize profit and revenue, but constrain image and things. So all those things can be done, but this is the foundation of doing those things. Now. What I did was very manual. Um, I, I did a very manual thing. I, it was a, you know, a, just a brute force calculation, if you will. And with two products and really 40 prices, which were nickel increments over a $2 range, 
I had 16, 1,600 dots on that graph uh, that I had to work with. If I had 10 products with 40 price combinations to consider, that's more, um, comp, you know, there's no computer, not even a, I, well, maybe a quantum computer could do it, I don't know, but um, it's, it's impossible. There's no way you could do that by brute force. So how do you, so how do you do price optimization when you have 10 products? I mean, that's very, you know, very much the reality of what we have to deal with in retail. Well, you use calculus. That's what you do. You know, science comes to the rescue. So this, a lot of math on this, really on this slide, all I want you to focus in is on this equation here. It's telling you that the optimum price is lambda times cost plus one over beta. This is the beta that I just showed you how to calculate. It's it's the it's it's a it's a parameter in the model, the demand model that you know really identifies the price sensitivity. So it's interesting. Um, you know what's this lambda thing then? I just introduced you know this lambda thing. Well, it's a parameter that tells you um, that's between zero and one. And if it's one, you're really going for max profit. If it's zero, you're going for max revenue. And you can, you know, move that parameter anywhere you want between zero and one. Um, and so, you know, it's it enters into the objective function as a as a lambda times profit plus one minus lambda times revenue. So when lambda is one, revenue drops out of the objective. When lambda is zero, profit drops out of the objective. So this is what we really care about right here. Now let's let's see what this really means this equation so there's the equation again I, you know i'm just repeating it what it means is that when you are at maximum revenue lambda is zero cost drops out and this maximum revenue point right there corresponds to a price that's one over beta that is that is a huge insight right there and if you want maximum profit, lambda is one, so what do you do? You just add cost to one over beta. So the width of the sweet spot is just cost. So that means you know the range of prices that, that move you from max profit, max revenue to max profit is, is equal to the um, to your cost. So what have we really done here? What we've really have done here is we've said your minimum price should be one over beta. And then you should add some portion of cost, depending on how much profit you really want. Well, how does that compare to cost plus pricing? Well, in cost plus, we started with cost and then we added a markup. We've turned this on its head and we've said, no, you should price based on customer sensitivity, which cost plus doesn't do. That's the real downfall of cost plus is it has no um, measure it you know or or provisions for pricing you know relative to customer sensitivity this this equation this optimal price it, it, it is rooted in customer sensitivity and then you just simply add cost to it so it's a very very interesting um approach to uh pricing when you contrast it with cost plus all right um so if we look at our opportunity curve, that price of one over beta that occurs when uh, you're at max revenue, that's the price that you're at right here. And then this price is cost plus one over beta, or really it should be one over beta plus cost because one over beta is kind of you're, you're rooted on that. Um, so now we're gonna, we're gonna divert here and look at business rules because it's very instructive to look at business rules here with these examples. Um, and then we're gonna, gonna come back to elasticity and promotions and such, but let's look at business rules for a second. And again, we're gonna look at this in a mathy way, but basically let's optimize price, but let's constrain, in this case, these two products to be priced equally. Okay, that, that's one constraint you could have. You could have lots of constraints. You could have, you know, one, product could be 10% more than the other because it's a, it's a more premium brand. You, you know, you could do all kinds of rules. We're gonna come to more rules, but this is instructive to start with just this most basic rule. Well, we know that um, this point corresponds to these two prices, these two products being priced the same. 
And it turns out all these other red dots also have these two products priced the same. So here they're at $2, here they're at $2 and a nickel, $2.10 and so on. So these are the only dots, the only profit and revenue combinations for which the two products are priced the same. So these are the only solutions in price that satisfy the constraint. So really these are the prices, these are the, this is the opportunity curve for the constrained optimization. We call this the constrained opportunity curve and we call this outer curve the unconstrained curve. So um, this, this is ex, you know, extremely valuable to have a, a pricing solution that shows you not only the unconstrained rule, but also the constrained rule. And the difference between these two gives you an idea of what the rules really may be costing you and whether it's worth it to have this, this constraint. Um, now let's look at some, you know, some, some additional rules and try to understand how we should optimize when we have, you know, some more general rules. So we're, we're looking at four rules here listed in order of priority such that our first competitive rule is the highest priority rule and uh, it, it, the rule is to be priced above this price and below that price. Our next competitive, our next highest priority rules is against say another competitor and uh, that rule says be above this price and below that price. We may have a margin rule that says be above this price and a size brand rule of some kind says be below this price. So this range of, of uh, prices that satisfy all the rules, we call this the, the range of viable prices. Now, in this example, the optimal price is outside that viable range. Obviously, if it was inside the viable range, we just pick whatever, wherever, you know, we would just pick that price. Uh, but if it's outside the viable range, what we try to do is minimize the non-optimality of our pricing. Um, but we, we comply with the rules. So we would price right here. This would be the recommended price because it's closest to optimal while still being in the viable range where we satisfy all the rules. Now let's take this example and say, well, what if this rule was more constraining? No problem. We're just gonna, you know, it just changes the viable range. Nothing's changed in our in our uh, example. But what if it goes all the way to here? And now uh, we, there is no range of prices that satisfy all the rules. Well, when that occurs, um, we look at the range of prices that satisfy the highest priority rules, and we, you know, the, the rules that are in conflict are, you know, are out you know, would want us to be outside that range. That doesn't mean we ignore these um, rules. What it means is that we're gonna recommend a price that uh, no longer tries to be, you know, over here and as optimal as possible, but one that minimizes the violation of this lower priority rule. The lower priority rule is there for a good reason, and we, we don't wanna violate it, uh, in you know in preference for being optimal we, we're trying to keep those rules um, you know we're trying to minimize any violation of that rule so so that's a, a very good way uh, to price uh, in a way that constrains your pricing by rules and tries to be as optimal as possible now again you may have a uh, this rule maybe it's more constraining Again, nothing changes, but what if it moves all the way to here? Now, um, I think it's instructive to think about this because yes, we're really violating that rule, but that's a lower priority rule than this one. And we wanna minimize the violation of the next highest priority rule. And so that would move our recommended price all the way over to here. So this is a really good way to think about constrained optimization and how to price with, with uh, business rules and still be as optimal as possible. Um, just, you know, this may seem like, wow, this is just a lot of math is, you know, can you really do this? Absolutely. Um, these solutions are very readily available where you have that unconstrained opportunity curve, the constrained opportunity curve, you see where you are today for your category and you can pick any point, um, in that constrained range. Um, and you can even go in then once you've picked your point, 
look at all the price recommendations, what rules are driving um, your recommendations, and so on. Um, so, uh, uh, so Jim, we have a couple questions about rules. Um, the first one is one of our challenges in man managing price is around localizing the rules. For example, we have competitors that vary by state. What is the best way to manage localized rules? Um, okay, so your rules should be localized to um, some combination of products and stores. Whether that's defined by nodes on your product hierarchy or your location hierarchy or some grouping, some defined group of products or some defined group of stores like a KBI group, um, you absolutely need to be able to specify your rules by a localized grouping of products and stores. But that's not really <clears throat> enough um, because the complexity and the manual fiddling of all these rules it's too much work to try to manage all those rules um, when you have to go very, very localized. So when you have to go very localized, there are techniques to do what we call hyper-localization. And I think, you know, now we're into something that's proprietary for clear demand. Uh, we, we think that we have a, a unique capability in this area that makes makes it very easy to uh, manage rules at a localized level but we can't really share that outside of an NDA so if you're interested in that uh, you know, we'll get tell you how to how to pursue that um, at the end of the presentation okay um, and then the next question we have is we have ending numbers and rounding rules how do we account for these um, so so ending numbers and rounding rules just limit you to certain price points like ending in nines and fours or whatever sevens and uh, i haven't really shown you how to how to do that the so there's a couple ways that you can do that one way is apply all the rules get to a price point and just round it at the end but really what you want to do is apply the rules with the rounding already considered so basically the viable range is defined by the uh, prices that satisfy the ending numbers. And if you can put your ending numbers in at that level of, of consideration and pricing, you get, you get results that are more consistent, more compliant, um, and better than, than otherwise. Uh, you really don't wanna just do rounding at the end. There are examples where that kind of falls down. Okay, and um, so, uh, there was one other question that came in. I think we missed it. It was um, to clarify: we are assuming collinearity between these two products, correct? Um, so these, no, these two products were completely independent. Um, so if if that's if that's not clear, just just uh, you know ask, and we can elaborate more. Okay, we are coming up on the home stretch here, um, right on time. So I just want to touch on a couple, really three quick little topics here. Um, first off is, can this science that we've covered here today and these techniques, can they be extended to personalized pricing or even tiered pricing? And the answer is absolutely yes. So what I'm showing you are some price, is a demand model or a, a, a model for unit sales as a function of, um, of all the sales that come from various tiers or from various uh, customer segments, either one. Each tier, each customer segment has its own price sensitivity. And um, so these tiers could be, you know, that the, these are my premium shoppers, these are my next premium shoppers and so on. Or, the, you know, these are the customers that get, you know, the one coupon, these get a different coupon. Or the, this could be the customers that buy one, the, these are the customers that buy 10, and maybe these are the customers that buy 100. All those things can be done. I wanna show you what that looks like. Um, what it looks like is, you know, if you're pricing the tiers or the segments the same, you might be here. If you price, you know, the more sensitive one with a 10% with a discount, it would put you around here. If you take the discount further, you start to get very close to optimal. So you can see that this, you know, that this really does extend to, um, you know, pretty far. It's amazing how much legs the science has in retail. Um, so now 
let's put that aside and return to this concept of price elasticity that I promised I would cover. And you're going to really like this little insight that comes out. So with our decaying exponential formula for unit sales, if you plug that in here, it turns out that um, your elasticity, which is defined by the percent change in unit sales over the percent change in price, it's just beta P. And um, it, so, it's, so we're saying that elasticity um, is a linear function of price. So as price goes up, elasticity goes up. That that seems, you know, that's that that's seems somewhat agreeable to our, our intuition. But what does it really mean? Well, what it means is that at an elasticity of one, a 10% price increase results in a drop of 10% in units. And at an elasticity of two, the same increase drops price twice as much. An elasticity of 0.5 says that same increase drops price half as much. So that's really what you want to think about you know that when you when you try to understand well what does this elasticity even mean but you can but it can go a little bit further now that you understand the opportunity curve and that at this price you're at maximum revenue the price of one over beta if i plug in that price into elasticity i have prices one over beta times beta this point right here occurs when elasticity is one so if you have an item in your, you know, where you measure an elasticity of one, you know you're right here. Um, if you're below one, you know that that's a good candidate to raise price. If you're above one substantially, you may be getting into the realm of wanting to lower price. So um, that's that's pretty useful. Now um, we're going to cover one last topic before we conclude, and that is promotion. So let's um, think about this example, where again, we're, we're considering the same product we've been using from the start, a product that sells about 60 at $2 and about 40 at $3. So we're gonna now say, well, that's, that's how much I sell when this item's on regular, when it's not on promo. But if I put it on promo, usually what happens is we sell more just because people see it more. But those people who are looking at the flyers, for example, they're they tend to be more price sensitive. So we're gonna, you know, so the example I'm showing here at the $2 price point has an elasticity of 0.8 for regular, but an elasticity of 1.2 for promo. So um, if, if this is the case, then here's what's interesting about it. Um, my opportunity curve for my regular sales at a $3 price point puts me in this this range of uh, the sweet spot range. And so that's a, a reasonable place to be priced. But when I promote, if I don't drop the price, I'm over here, which is you know a, a price point that, you know, uh, where I really should be, uh, which is too high. I really need, I really should lower the price at least to maximum profit, if not, you know, getting it into this range. But you have to be very careful because um, just a few nickel increments and you could drop, you know, precipitously on this graph, giving up a huge amount of profit. So having a good promo model, have, you know, having an understanding of what these curves look like for your items on promo is really, really important to make sure you promote effectively and, and so on. Obviously, there's a lot of other considerations with vendor deals and so on, but um, I think this this insight is worth having. Now, that really concludes our presentation today, um, which, which again, really focused on this efficient frontier. Um, the, you know, let's just review real quickly, um, and I see some more questions coming in, but we, you know, these were the questions we wanted to answer today. When should I take price up and down? What's optimal? Um, how do I do it in Excel? What's efficient pricing? You know, how do I price with business rules? What's price elasticity, and how do I optimize promotions? I think we've covered the the foundations of all of these questions. So, you know, hopefully I, this has been very valuable to you. Um, I've got one question here. Um, 
uh, it's, it says, does personalized pricing functionality exist in CDI or does it require customization? It absolutely exists in, uh, in clear demand. Um, so that's part of the promo solution. So, uh, so with that, I'm going to, um, uh, wish, wish everybody, you know, again, thank you. Wish you well.